All right, so let's move to tight end, and then we'll close out with running back. So tight end, I'm moving through the list here. Uh, I'm going to give you one that I think is, to me, kind of like around 10 range bottom line starter, but he's going a lot earlier in drafts. And I know we've teased Higby. I'll talk about him in a second. But let me lead off with Darren Waller. I like Waller, um, but there were there were reasons last year that Darren Waller um, started to excel. Um First of all, they didn't have a downfield threat, so they had to work the middle of the field. Uh, so they had Hunter Renfro, who was still coming on. Darren Waller was getting just eating up targets, uh, as well as Tyrell Williams. Well, this year, they've added a bunch of pieces to that. Not only that, but they added Greg Olson at the position. They have the the other tight end there, the other rookie. Um, or Sorry, he was a rookie last year. I can never remember his name for some reason. You probably know it offhand. I can never remember the backup guys. But the other guy was getting all the red zone targets. Help me out Moro. with that. Moreau. Moreau, Foster Moreau. Yeah, Foster Moreau, because there's two Foster Moreaus in the league, but he's the only tight end. Foster Moreau eats up red zone targets. I don't think Greg Olson's, um, not Greg Olson, I'm sorry, Jason Witten. I don't think Jason Witten is going to be eating up um, a ton of red zone targets, but he's another guy at tight end, and he blocks well, so he's going to be on the field for that run-based offense. Rugs down the field. Um, you got Terrell Williams, who I think is going to be uh, a lot better than people think because of the addition of Rugs. I think Waller, although he'll catch more touchdowns this year, he just has to. I, I think the targets and the receptions are going to be down. So I'm not necessarily fading him in like non-PPR leagues, but if you're in a PPR league, I just don't think he's worth the draft capital at this point. Agree or disagree? Well, uh, first, I like him better in PPR leagues, and I'm also not fading Darren Waller. And here's why. You talk about the, the regression to the receptions and the yards, but then you mentioned as well— he only scored three touchdowns yeah. last year. So if we see the touchdowns go up one, two, three touchdowns, it should buffer a little bit of the loss of the receptions in the yardage. And he caught, what, 90 passes, 1,100 yards last year? Like, he can regress a little bit and still be a 75 reception, 900-yard tight end, which mm-hmm. is fantastic if you can get in the fifth, sixth round. And then you talk about the fact that they paid him. After he performed, they wanted to retain him. They clearly have plans to keep him as a main function of this offense. They did add some wide receivers this year, which is concerning. But again, two of them are rookies. Tyrell Williams already, I believe he uh, separated his shoulder. Something that is serious is he had a serious shoulder injury this year that he's going to try and fight through for the rest of the year. So we don't even know if Tyrell Williams ends up on injured reserve at some point. Sure. I do like Renfro, but I just I don't know if any wide receiver is going to be ready to dominate targets year one. So I think Darren Waller is still going to finish as Oakland's leading receiver this year. Hmm, interesting. So why don't you give me one on your list? Because I only have one more, and I've already talked about him a little bit on this show. Oh, well, that's who I'm going to talk about, my <laughs> Go for friend. it. Go for it. Give it to me. Tyler Higby. All right, right now in PPR scoring, he's going as tight and seven. That's above Evan Ingram and Hayden Hurst, which just does not make sense to me. We've talked about it before. Mm. If you follow me on Twitter, if you want to check out the article I wrote at my site at guruffantasyworld.blogspot.com, I put up a massive thread against Tyler Higby, and there's just so much evidence against him that it's hard to ignore the multiple factors, right? You talk about the main factor being Gerald Everett coming back. Those last five games, they were amazing, right? They were amazing for Tyler Higby. He out-targeted Johnny Munt 56 to 5. 56 to 5 in those five games, guys. That's not going to happen this Mm -hmm. year with the tight end split. Tyler Higby's not taking 90% of the tight end targets. I hate to break it to you. It just ain't going to happen. Gerald Everett's a 4-6-2 running second-round tight end pick who was progressing in all three years. Sean McVay wants to use him. They went and spent the second round pick on Van Jefferson. They're still going to run plenty of three wide receiver sets to take Tyler Higby. Who's in a split tight end committee over a guy like Evan Ingram, who really all he needs to do is stay healthy to just be a league winner Mm -hmm. or Hayden Hurst, who is, has the entire tight end room to himself in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I I think it makes zero sense, especially when you talk about he's at a 68 overall ADP. You got to take that guy in the sixth round to get him. It makes no sense. It makes I I agree, and I'm just going to give you different reasons why I agree. Uh, because I, I I agree with everything you said. Let me throw some more at everybody about Tyler Higby. 
We're trying to talk you off the ledge, people. Do not take him as early as he's going. Don't don't do it. Um, so we talk about we talk about um, other tight ends in, in schemes. We talk about a lot of offensive scheme on this show. Uh, Evan Ingram, new scheme. Jason Garrett calling plays. Well, Jason Garrett will use the tight end, um, you know, extensively in his offense. Evan Ingram is going to be strong there. Um, Austin Hooper gone from Atlanta. Hay- Hayden Hurst comes in there. Um, they throw the ball quite a bit. They're a passing offense. First of all, they pass like 80% of the time. Yes, I know Led you have... Led the league Hul- last year. Yeah, they have Julio Jones. Yes, I get it. They have Calvin Ridley. Yes, I get it. I like Russell Gage. Um, you know, I think he's being drafted too low. If you're in a deeper league, like a 14-team league or something like that, take uh, Russell Gage because he'll give you decent value on the bottom of your bench. But look, man, like Hayden Hurst... Hayden Hurst athletically is very strong. He's super... He's one of these kind of like really fast guys. He's not a blocker, but that's not what the scheme wants. This scheme wants to throw the ball. He's going to be a mismatch at the tight end position all year. He should absolutely, Hayden Hurst, should absolutely be ahead of Higby. Um, Now, Higby, you mentioned Gerald Everett. In years past, there have been times where Higby's gone down, you know, for one, two, three weeks at a time or something like that. And Gerald Everett had a very similar uplift that we saw Hayden, um, I'm sorry, Tyler Higby have at the end of last season. This offense likes both of these players. I would argue that when both are healthy, uh, McVay tends to like Gerald Everett a little bit more than Tyler Higby. So when these two players on the field, I feel like Everett is a little bit more um, integral, but they also kind of play a little bit of a hot hand approach. And I think whoever has the better week in practice will probably play. Just because Higby had a great five, uh, you know, last five weeks or whatever it was last year, Everett wasn't on the field, man. He's a good tight end. McVay likes him. That's important. And I'll give you one more schematic based thing. The Rams could not get the ball, um, could not run the ball last year. Goff was throwing the ball way too much. Um, and that's not going to be what the system does this year. They will get back to the run. Uh, they have, you know, Cam Akers coming in there. I know they're still going to run a committee, uh, probably approach there as well. Higby's not going to have the quality of the targets. He's not going to have the volume of targets. And he's going to be competing with Gerald Everett, who everybody is just dismissing at this point. It's just, it's not reality. And, and that's me, way too much risk. That too. Yeah, because uh, you bring up a good point about how it worked the same way with Gerald Everett. Like the main thing that was propelling Tyler Higby to this production in those last five games, it was the snap share. It was yeah. the fact that he was yes. on the field. He was running all the votes. He didn't go below 86% of the snaps in any one of those five games. He was between 86 and 97% of the snaps, right? You look at the one game he missed last year at the beginning of the year. Gerald Everett played 88% of the snaps in that game. So it's not like, oh, they just fell in love with Tyler Higby. When one of these guys get hurt, they relied on the other guy. Now Gerald Everett, he's not hurt. It's going to go back to being a close, maybe it's a 60-40 split to Tyler Higby, but it's going to be a split. It's not going to be a 56-5 to target split like it was with Tyler Higby and Johnny Munt in the last five games. Yeah, I I mean, it's, it's... I don't. I, I truly. I don't understand the hype. And then, you know, I've I've talked to people that think that Higby is going to be working the middle of the field and Cooper. That's why people are fading Cooper Cup. I'm just like guys. I mean, Cooper Cup's had multiple good seasons, being Jared G- Cook's number one option. Like, yeah, right. We have mo- oh, what, over thirty games of Cooper Cup producing with Jared Cup. We have five games of Tyler Higby, and Cooper Cup was probably hurt. You look at. Last year, those last five games, I believe it was against Pittsburgh, he only played like 30% of the snaps. So that was clearly injury-based. He wouldn't have played under 50% of the snaps if he wasn't hurt. So there was something going on with Cooper Cup in those last five games. It's, again, part of the factor of why Tyler Higby did what he did. But to just assume it's going to continue like that into this year is just... Dude, not something I'm on board with. You're talking about you're talking about like red zone offense. So we've seen in recent years. You now I know Brandon Cooks is gone, um, and but you know they're they're going to run three wide receiver sets. Uh, Robert Woods and and historically Cooks, but somebody else this year. You know they get a lot of the over the top threat. You know um, things, but this team this team wants to run the ball in between the twenties. And when they get in there, they'll still run on the goal line if they can get in. I mean even Gurley, I think he had double digit touchdowns last year, if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah. in his quote unquote bad year. So this team will run on the goal line. But if you look at this red zone offense, they throw the ball to their slot receiver. And uh, this isn't a new thing. McVay did the same thing in Washington when he was the coordinator there. Um, they will throw the ball to their slot receiver. And Cup, when he's healthy, scores a touchdown like every other game. 
Um, historically. <laughs> and this just... is not just one season. Yeah. yeah. This is multiple times. Multiple... He's been a touchdown maker since he's came into the league. Yeah, the one who owns the middle of this field strategically for the Rams is Cup. And I like the tight ends, but I only like the tight end if one of the others hurt. And I'm telling you, it, it, they're interchangeable for me. If if Higby goes down, I like I like Everett. And I would pick him up off of waivers, but I wouldn't put him on my team in draft-wise. And really, that's it for me at tight end. Uh, I don't mind anybody else. I see more value there than I see, like, eh, I don't like this guy here. You know, I can't really make a strong argument against anybody else. How about you? Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Maybe Kyle Rudolph at tight end 16. I just feel like there's higher upside options out yeah. there. Dallas Goddard, Joe New Smith, even Blake Jarwin I would take. Chris Herndon especially I would take before Kyle Rudolph. Um, I don't think there's really a whole lot of justification justification for putting Kyle Rudolph at tight end 16. Yeah, you know, if Herndon can stay healthy, um, I mean, th- that Jets tight end is going to have value. I mean, we saw Ryan Griffin – lead the league in, at, at tight end and fantasy points like two or three weeks out of the last eight maybe two it was it, it was definitely that but when we do the fantasy football fallout you know the players that kick you in the nuts and all that um or the hey i'm watching you you know the spotlight the eye of sauron is what i use for that. but um you know <laughs> when we start doing this uh these segments you know after week one which i'm gonna love doing um you see some really interesting thing, like Fitzpatrick led quarterbacks um, and Tannehill led quarterbacks, like both of them, like two out of the last, like maybe 10 weeks. Oh, he led me to a champion. I wouldn't say led. Lamar might have had something to do with sure. that. But Ryan Fitzpatrick helped me win championships yeah, last there you, year. I mean, you can find value, and but like Jets tight end is one you got to keep your eye on. You really do um, because you know, Darnold likes throwing to his tight end. That's uh, that's important when when. You know, when quarter, quarterbacks always have that, like, when you have two players and you're scrambling out of the pocket, like, who do you look for? And the Rams, I would argue, that's Cooper Cup. J- Jared Goff, when he's under pressure and he's throwing, he's looking for Cooper Cup because he's going to make a play to him. Darnold likes to do that with tight end. So you need to pay attention to that stuff as well. 